<laughs> so for, first, I, I, I don't know why she put me with this group. This is a really <laughs> difficult. I'm not worthy of this group. Sheila, you like James Brown. You can't go on after that. I, you put the cape on, you come back out and all that. Sheila, do you need some water? <laughs> uh, I <I'm> already <laughs> ate. First of all, I just want to say, man, I'm just, I'm just proud to be on this, 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 this stage with y'all, man. I've, 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 I've read a lot of all y'all's work, man. And so I just want to thank y'all for always giving so much of yourself and allowing somebody like me to be inspired and, and try to just add my two cents on building on the work that y'all been doing. So thank y'all so much, man. All y'all. Well, thank you. Right. This is incredible. Thank you. <laughs> Christopher, the, the, Christopher, the research, and Stephen, just the passion, just being an open book, because I, ha I have a similar experience as you as well. So mm -hmm. this is just phenomenal. I just want to jump right in and uh, I'll get as much from the audience as I can, but I want to touch on something that all three of you touched on, have some interconnective tissue there. Uh, the highbrow white rock culture, which mm -hmm. uh, as a musician, I just have this this great just uh, firsthand insight on. So I just want to hear your perspective, looking through the lens of Prince, uh, having all of this technical facility that he has as a musician, having all these great ideas, consciously deciding to strip Dirty Mind down, because really there's not a lot of guitar heroics on that, a lot of great rhythm stuff. But I want you to talk about that conscious decision and it kind of plays into the whole declaration and subversion as well. So taking that sonic declaration into Dirty Mind against that white rock establishment, showing that basically all this comes from us anyway. If you, you guys want to kind of pontificate upon that a little bit. Hmm. See, Lee, if you want to start. Okay, I was kind of, I was yeah. going with, um, <laughs> I, I, I think that a couple of things, right, that you have, and with Prince, we've always deal with two things, right? The 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 authentic expression of himself and his understanding of navigating the corporate of the industry, right? right. And so, what you have with, with with Prince and stripping everything down is right. And he said, he said the first two albums were for the company, right? Mm -hmm. This album is for myself, right? So he makes that direct statement. He said, this album is for myself. But he's also he, he you you he's coming into a point where. By the third album, you have a young man, right? Even regardless of race, you have a young man at the age of thinking about who the hell am I? Right. Right. What do I want to be? Right. What legacy do I want to leave? Right. And I think that that's what you're hearing, and a lot of it being stripped down is that it's stripped down because it's possibly becoming one of his most honest assessments of who he is, both as a poet and a musician. Right. It is. It is one of those things where. He is, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, to, to steal a quote from Nelson George, right, Prince is, the, is, a, is an encyclopedia of rock and roll, right? What Dirty Mind is, you're getting a young male in his 20s announcing to the world, I want to be as bare and as stripped down as I am, so that if this sinks or swims, it will be able to say, I did this in the way that I wanted to do it, so that America can truly understand what black talent is about, right? Because I think that I end on this, because I think the one thing that comes from that Kara Cooper article is that again, Prince wasn't interested in being a special Negro, right? Prince said, no, 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 there are a lot of great black musicians. Mm -hmm. right? It's just the fact that we get put in a genre that doesn't allow for us to stretch out as much. Mm -hmm. So I think that he was looking at Dirty Mind as a way to say, if I kick this door down, it won't just be me escaping from this plantation. It'd be every black musician, male and female, who could escape from this plantation with me. Absolutely, that's amazing. Uh, Steve, Christopher, guys, want to jump in on that and just kind of talk about a little bit of that sonic declaration and that sonic uh, challenge uh, that Dirty Mind uh, kind of enters uh, the realm with. Well, I think a lot of it for me is just that was the landscape of music at that point, you know, 79, right. 80, 81, that's post-disco, mm -hmm. it's post-punk technically. So for him to be able to assert that he could in fact do that was really more of an assessment of his skill. And the fact that he was so critical of how bad most of the vocalists were was really an opportunity for him to kind of reintroduce that punk music and that sort of style could mm -hmm. really have a little bit of style to it, but all it has to do is just have a good vocal with it or just have something that really sticks out. So I think for him, it was just really an opportunity for him to just kind of put his own spin on it without really biting the influences that he had. And that's something that I think that most artists really strive to do at that moment to really have a voice as a black musician. That was hard enough in itself. I mean, never mind charts, never mind press. Let's just have a voice that people latch mm -hmm. on to. 
Mm-hmm. So for him to be able to do that was a very bold statement. Too bad that the record industry didn't know what to do with it, nor his management. But the fact that he was still strong in that conviction and strong in that voice was something I think that we could really learn from. Absolutely. Hmm. So I want to say this, and I think um, because I think about the the that Prince is a pastiche artist, so he's always sort of referencing, nodding towards, um, and sort of putting into his work the various things that those men and women did before him. And I I read something recently by this guy named uh, Michelangelo Matos, who did one of those 33 and a half um, sign of the times things, right? And so he's comparing the way Prince was dancing in Dirty Mind. He says it was sloppy, it was all over the place. But by the time Prince gets to uh, 1999, he is more comfortable in front of the camera. He's more direct and what have you. And I, I, I've read a lot of white musician um, critics over the years that seems to kind of miss the mark, you know, when it comes to Prince. Um, so when I saw Dirty Mind as an adult and had a better understanding of Prince's, I want to do it this way, I want to perform this way. I even think about Prince sort of like, holding back on his guitar skills, holding back on certain things, right. and then sort of like, sort of putting them out as needed. I mean, if we could take what Morris said and what other people, I'm sure Jill and I'm sure that Andre can speak to this. Yeah. This man is very, very direct and deliberate. Uh-huh. So That's listen, it. That whole messy dancing thing just made me think, somebody might think, oh, he must be biracial because he can't dance like a black man. <laughs> I'm feeling like, Oh shit, you know, <laughs> Prince for days, you can just pull stuff. You could take one album and write about it for a year or talk about it for a year because he was so such an interesting figure. And again, I want to always mention that people always take their own sensibilities into what Prince was doing, regardless if they're scholars or not, but they reveal what appeals to them about this man, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. That's excellent. Excellent. Excellent insight. Uh, since Steve, I was going to stick with you for one quick sec, uh, mm-hmm. just to, and then we'll pass it on everybody else. The fun and dangerous uh, aspect of it, that is hard to create a sense of danger that is appealing. Mm-hmm. And, so, and what about what about the construction of this, the writing, the songwriting, the general construction, even sonically? Uh, appealing, because sometimes dangerous is a repellent. Like it's too much and yeah, it's too dark, yeah, yeah. right? But we were getting, like I said, you know, the context is really important when we think about punk and we think about disco. Disco was like I said, it was more like dancey, it's fun, everyone's having a great time. Studio Fifty Four, punk was like we're interested in ter- we're anti-establishment, mm-hmm. do you know, right. and we're we're young, we're the teenagers, and we have something to say, and we're trying to figure out how to say it. A lot of punk musicians, it wasn't. It wasn't necessary for you to be a good musician as a punk musician. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, and for me, when it came to Prince in this idea of danger, or this idea of him being singular, he was putting himself out there. If we just look at him, there was something very fun. But did you want to go outside in your underwear and like warmers? You know, this notion that that toxic black masculinity <laughs> that <laughs> that always exists, you know, but. But I do want to say this in, in relationship to my own experience growing up in the Midwest is that there were always different kinds of black men around, whether they were ultra feminine or ultra masculine. Right. It was how, how they related to their communities. This was pre-AIDS in terms of who thought you should be around my kids and so forth, because gay men had a role in those communities. Yes. Uh-huh. I don't recall the, the, um, the backlash to Prince when I was a kid. People just thought he was cool because he was doing something unique. That was my thing. And he had already given us two albums. And again, like when I think of I Want to Be Your Lover, I just I feel summertime. It feels very fresh and new. Dirty Mind was like, hey, sister. That's all I got to say. And I was like, and that's, no, that's enough. Sister, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, not that is, no, not them. You know, but like, <laughs> I, 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 I think just to add that, it, what also added is edge and danger. Because somebody, one of you made a great point that what's, what's interesting about Dirty Mind is that there's not a whole lot of lead guitar, but what Prince did was he kind of deconstructed, deconstructed and opened up the possibility of what rhythm guitar could be. Uh-huh. Exactly. And okay. so yeah. okay. if you think sonically about how Dirty Mind sounds, what he does is 
the the keyboard gives you the breadth, the fullness. Mm -hmm. And the rhythm of guitar becomes a double-edged sword on both sides of the the keyboard. So what you really are getting then is a kind of driving grunge sound through every song. Uh, and and, you know, and when you and when you don't get that, you still get the kind of guitar plucking and got a broken heart again. Right. So I think that sonically, right, he's thinking of, he's thinking about right. How can I take all these sounds that I've heard black men say? Right, if you think about somebody like Ernie Isley, right, and the way that Ernie Isley played guitar, right, right. and how he had to kind of play guitar underneath, mm -hmm. right, if you're just thinking about how all these great black R and B guitar players who came from this history of blues were really dangerous black dudes, right? They were dangerous just joint black dudes. Mm -hmm. He was able to take that kind of sonic sound without long guitar solos and give it an edge that your average R&B didn't have because he was pulling the volume up to where you could all, there's sometimes in, in the Dirty Mind album, throughout the album, you can't even tell the, the synthesizers from the guitar because the blade of the guitar is so well uh, uh, welded well to the, to the synth sound. Mm. That's a great insight. That's, in, that's incredible. Uh, Christopher, did you have any, any thoughts on the sonic mood that was created with Dirty Mind? I know for me, I was born in 82, so that was the album that <laughs> <laughs> the same as you, right? So yeah. you're born with Pur Purple Rain, The Sign of Times, and Dimes of Pearls. And then around that age, you get Dirty Mind. And I think that's the crossroads where you really become a Prince fan, however that hits you outside mm -hmm. of these mega albums. And it was for me, it was because of the mood. I just, it slapped mm -hmm. you in the face. If you can uh, speak to that a little bit, being that we're born in the same year, that sonic aesthetic that everyone was talking about. Well, I mean, for me, because one of the very first songs that I remember, my mom, because my mom was a big record buyer, and Kiss was the very first song that I remember her playing. Great, great was, example. The 12 inch version. And you know, when you listen to that song, the guitar is just out of this world, and just the minimalism mm -hmm. and the drum programming, the, mm -hmm. the only thing you can do is just rock to it and just dance and just get your boogie on. But when you hear Dirty Mind and then you're working backwards, it's almost like, he did this shit? Like, wait a minute. Like, like, why, like why does he sound like Joe Strummer or why does this sound better than Joe Barry or better than Jim yeah. Page? So for me, it was more or less just kind of reflecting on this idea that a black guitarist can do whatever the hell he wants to do. And when right. you have someone right. that, that good, it doesn't matter what sort of layers they put on the record or how funky it sounds. If they can play, they can play. If they can go, they can go. But right. the but the mood that you get when you listen to Dirty Mind is that I'm one of the dopest cats around and I can play any goddamn thing I want to play. Anything. <laughs> anything. Thought you knew. Anything. Anything. <laughs> and Celia, uh, you have such a great point. And I, I felt like... <laughs> This was like one of my random trivia things I should have absorbed, but I'm, I'm just learning. Uh, the 1976 to 89 gap of the top rock charts. Now, and, and in conjunction with that, in 2003, the Rolling Stone top 100 guitarists did not have Prince on that list at all. Yeah. Uh, disgrace. Look at it, right? Disgrace. <laughs> you look at that list. Great guitar mm -hmm. players on that list, but there's not many that can do everything that we're talking about. Prince did on Dirty Mind, the funky rhythm stuff. Clearly, the shredding, the jazz right. stuff on stuff like strolling and, and the stuff in the vault and with uh, Madhouse. So oh, yeah. if we if we could just talk about that, like just these different hurdles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, as a black man, I had to play to chess the, with. Yeah, I think that goes back to the to the the disco demolition issue. I think one of the real problems was that often someone like Prince is perceived to be too talented for his own good. Mm. How dare you be able to play guitar better than any other white guy and then dance better than anybody else too? Yeah, supremacy. <laughs> How dare you be able to do that and then play piano better than anybody else? And so one of the real hurdles for Prince is not just aesthetically, but the range of sounds that he can produce, right? The, the, the average Prince album may be a bit too sophisticated for the average one genre listener. Mm -hmm. Like if you are a person that you only listen to one genre, you will die trying to listen to any Prince album because there's, there, I, I dare you to name one Prince album that has just one genre. So one of the real problems was that he just refused to stand still and strum his guitar the way we were used to seeing white guitars do. And that became 
uh, threatening. And I, and, I, and I end with this. The great story, and I'm sure you guys heard the great story about Pete Townsend and Eric Clapton oh, yeah. when Jimmy Richards first came to England, right? And they and they hate each other. So Pete Townsend and Eric Clapton hate each other, but then here comes Jimmy Hendrix blowing everything out the water, so they form a relationship. I really think that a lot of that backlash to Prince mm-hmm. was just the fact that he was so damn good and so threatening. How dare he be that threatening as a black man mm-hmm. when we spent entire American history making you a monolithic thing? I completely agree with that. I think that who's writing the stories, who's making up these lists? Go, right. Steven. And it's, <laughs> you just go, Steven. Of course, it's, it, it, it's very basic shit. And it's also like it, it, it. So when I think of somebody like Nina Simone, who is genreless as well, like they're just certain black artists that are genreless. They just sing whatever they sing. And, and, and then people put them in boxes because it's easier for them to be sold. And the most appealing things about Prince is that Prince had a musicality and a sensibility that he was willing to explore and move around and share in some cases with other people. There is so much to be said about criticism, white criticism, starting with jazz right. and these people who make up the rules, well, try to make up the rules anyway. Like you said, when Jimi Hendrix came along, they had to, you know, not him, not him. <laughs> not him. Let me let me show you what I can do. Even little Richard, little Richard was like, I remember going, why is little Richard 1984 going? Y'all never gave me nothing. Then I saw him perform. It was like, oh yeah, <laughs> you learn, you learn. So as with all things African American or Afro Caribbean or African, anything in the diaspora, black folks already did it already are probably doing it right now and you just don't know about it right, right. That's it. yeah and to your point and thank you Stephen, for making that comment it's a lot like what you're seeing right now in the news since all the uprisings and the protests how now all of a sudden everybody wants a black journalist everybody wants a black writer to write and, <laughs> it's, and it's one of them and, one of, <laughs> and you know it's, and it's interesting because when you think about these cumulative listicles that you read in these publications it's not many of us writing those stories so when you right. see a lot of those lists it's still young millennial gen z white writers giving assignments and I can say this because I can show you all the pictures in the world between me and editors at every big publication possible. We're not in those rooms writing those stories. But if you ask any black editor at any publication in this generation, they can damn sure tell you that Prince is a great guitar player. He's a great writer. If you put on a ballad, somebody gets some draws. But it's, it's all kind of stuff that we can literally draw and pull from versus if you hear the average white person, the only thing they're going to reference in at least in the publication world, is that Prince is a hell of a guitar player. And and that's a very limiting thing. So I think to your question, a lot of that that we're facing is mainly because we are not in those seats present, present given that voice. And I think as long as we're more visible in that space, you'll start to see him rank in those sort of mainstream mm-hmm. listings. Interesting. Great takes. I like what you said about the um, what they would refer to Prince as a good, great guitarist. It's when and where you enter, to use a Paula Giddings um, right. title. Yeah. It's where, when and where you enter. You get an assignment to cover a Prince album. You might want to look at that in context. You just don't listen to that one album. That's right. What did he do before? What did he do after? Who was he producing at the time? What's the um, climate of the culture in that moment? There are all these different things. I think a good music journalist will spend some time doing his or her or their work. You have to. But deadlines, three dollars for your things. You know, I did the um the music thing for a moment. It was very um music journalism freelance and it was difficult. Yeah, was right. Difficult. They want you to say, is it good? Right. Is it bad? Right. <laughs> Just nonsense, right? You know? Just not like no deep dives or anything to really kind of situate the story so that more people can really come on board. Hence my point. It yeah. was the press that really unpack these layers and really showcase right, right. the potential that this guy had versus once he finally get to the mainstream press and, mm-hmm. they're, and they're trying to you know explicate and you know annotate and pull apart the words but it's just not mm-hmm. there yeah. you know? i agree mm-hmm. interesting this is great i uh so i'm gonna make a bit of a reach so you know dirty mind didn't go platinum until like the purple rain era so kind of mm-hmm. goes back to a point that uh, Christopher made, just the slow commercial build, like the slow commercial success, obviously wasn't successful out the gate. And 
tying this into something that uh, C. Lee said, uh, essentially, what more do black people want, right? And this, I want to tie this into control because this is like a theme of Prince throughout his whole career from his first contract with Warner Brothers all the way up until the mid 90s, uh, you know, slave on the face air, always about control, even artists that, you know, approach him, which we all know, he will say, do you own your masters? Do you think all of this, especially with Dirty Mind, do you think this was the, the jumping off point? If he could get this in, if mm-hmm. this could be that that seed that, you know, the, where the vine grows and tears everything down, do you think he had that kind of foresight uh, in the beginning and, you know, creating this album in spring 1980, or was it something that kind of evolved as he saw that, Hey, they're giving me an inch here. I can keep pushing it. I'm out here in the mm-hmm. suburbs, you know, in Minnesota, nobody's bothering me. We can, we can do it. They're going to push this demo as an, as an album. You know, do you think he had that kind of foresight in, in the beginning to start? I think, and I think it was Stephen who quoted the, uh, the Morris day book, uh, if I'm not mm-hmm. mistaken. I, and I just, and I just wrote a uh, review of it myself. Um, Morris is very clear that as a ninth, 10th grader, Prince knew exactly what he wanted to be and where he wanted to go. Right. So you have to think about let's let's think of just 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 four. We just four black dudes here talking, right? Mm-hmm. I know who the hell I wanted to be in ninth grade. I mean, I I, I just want to be really clear about. <laughs> and so Prince here, right? For whatever, and so what I've always wanted to know, and and the research wanted to be is. Where was he getting his expansive education that by ninth, 10th, 11th grade, he basically had an, he, he had an, an encyclopedia of American music in his head and an encyclopedia of American culture in his head. Mm-hmm. One of the things that Owen Huntsley said to me, I got the interview with Owen Huntsley, he said that, he said one of the greatest things about Prince is that Prince always had a genius to be able to look into other people's backyard and take what they were doing to the next level. So I think that kind of to your question, it was with Dirty Minds, he had already been thinking about prior to signing his deal with Warner Brothers, how can I be different than anybody else? Mm -hmm. He understood that he needed to be two things, good and different, and he had to be equally good and equally different, and that is what creates a great artist. I always tell my students this, great is if something is different after you, than before you. Mm-hmm. So all the people that we consider great, life after them are different than life before them. And so I just think that he was thinking about Dirty Mind as resetting that clock of before he got his deal of this will be the thing that will kick down the doors and again, gradually do more of exactly who I want to be. Mm-hmm. Well, well, I think when you grow up in a place like Minneapolis, which is majority white, Obviously, mm-hmm. stuff, obviously, the stuff that's on the radio is the more mainstream, more massive stuff that people like. So mm-hmm. for somebody like him who really paid close attention to what was on maybe AM radio, what was on black radio, the little bit of black radio that was there, there was an idea that there was something consistent between all of those songs that he heard. So naturally, one of the things that he made clear in early press was that he knew how to write a hit by a second album. Right. It, it was right. too easy. It was too easy. Right. Yeah. But Nonetheless, it was something bigger, something more broader, something more experimental that he was going for. So to C. Lee's point, that was already there. That was nothing to worry about. I think it was more or less a concern for the audience to really pick up on it. But for Prince himself, that was already kind of in his DNA that, okay, here's what a hit sounds like. Here's what a good song sounds Mm -hmm. like. Here's what I can do to maybe tighten this up. And even he said in several interviews that he didn't listen to the radio a lot of times when he was in the studio because it was a distraction and it was seeping to his work. So a great deal of what he really wanted to do anyway was just be original, but just to really try to figure out where his voice was. Even as a journalism professor, I can tell you one of the things I try to encourage my students to do is find their Mm -hmm. voice. What does it sound like? Is it funny? Mm -hmm. Can it make you cry? Like, are you detail or, you know, you fact driven, whatever that is, figure that out. But you have, you know, a rotation in your journey where it does develop and it does come. And I think with Prince, it was one of those things where once you listen to the records, you can see that that was slowly building up and that was already there. Mm-hmm. But for the sake of him just getting his foot in the door, he just kind of played by the rules, but just knew what was there. Right. Good point. Yep. You, you know, and, and to your, both of your points, Prince had a hit album 
the second album was a hit. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> he, was tra- he was touring. He was a hit maker. So I think he had some leverage to kind of do this Dirty Mind album, to of do course. what he wanted to do. Mm-hmm. He recorded in isolation. There weren't the the executives or people like breathing over him, trying to, what are you doing, kid? He knew how to produce an album. Right. And like you said, Christopher, he knew how to make a hit. Right. So I think Warner Brothers... I mean, because it's really hard. No matter how much I read, I'm always kind of like going, well, who wrote this? <laughs> and right. Who's saying this or whatever? But my, my instincts think that Warner Brothers knew they had somebody on their hands that was unique mm-hmm. and were willing to let him s- space because they were going to get their money. Right. They, were, they were willing to invest. And this is the time in which record companies gave you a few albums right. that they thought you had potential because right. they knew that you could build from that right it's a very different game right now and it was a different game say even in the 80s mm-hmm. you know Prince got in on that tail end of bruce springsteen and other kinds of artists that they knew had talent but weren't met on um, best sellers but then all that sort of peaked in the 80s for a lot of people right right and also think, think about prince in terms of a hybrid artist in terms of michael jackson and someone like whitney houston i'd really love for those three to kind of be thought of as being pioneers in the 80s. Like, Mount so, yeah, B, Whitney was the promise of Dion, her mama, right. <laughs> Dee, Dee and all these other women that sang gospel and sang the fuck out of gospel, but she could she could pull back on the runs. She right. could do, but so she was able to, she told Robin, her girlfriend, stick with me, I'll take you around the world because she knew her talent. Right. Mm-hmm. Jackson was constantly, you know, developing and growing and had a longer gestation period than either of the other two in a way. And he knew the game. He knew the game. And so those three really like uh, I think are really important to kind of think about what what the industry was doing and what they expected of black artists. Right. It's incredible. Yeah. And, and I just wanted to uh, just kind of clarify when I say, you know, trying to be different, does it I, I don't mean being contrived. Right. I, I mm-hmm. won't right. Put it, okay. saying the prince was contriving. I'm simply saying that everybody, we all know our, our strengths and our weaknesses, right? We all know right. our we all know what's our best, best camera shot. I, I see, you know, people who never gonna be in the movies, you take a picture of wait a minute, get me on this side right here, get me here. So I think that what Prince was doing when I say being original was just thinking about how can I best amplify all of the things that I do better and right. different than everybody else. Right, right. Just uh, I know we got a hard stop at five thirty. One of my favorite <laughs> anecdotes on uh, Dirty Mind, and this was um, uh, a little Jim from uh, Jimmy Jam, and he later employed this on the Control album when they started working with Janet. Prince mm. recorded Dirty Mind with what they call All in the Red, so every channel on the mixing board was distorted. So even though the composition and the arrangement may be you know sparse in nature, it feels full because uh, with analog recording, you have so much headroom. I mean, where you can turn it to eight, nine, and everything's <laughs> softly distorting. So it's very warm. So anytime you play Dirty Mind, that's what I mean. It just slaps you in the face. It just, no matter what volume you got it at, it's always going to slap you in the face. So that kind of studio wizardry, which we also, uh, you know, just really revere about Prince that Susan Rogers and uh, Peggy McCreary always talk about, just his ability to, you know, like, Amplifying, you know, the ability. Well, I have all this time. Let's record it in the red and see what happens. Right. This, mm-hmm. this feels great. Let's rock with it. Let's do the whole album like that. So, you know, he's the best. He's the greatest. That's why we're here. And the <laughs> other greatest is here, D'Angelo, to kick us off. <laughs> <laughs> the beautiful one herself. The beautiful right. one. You guys yes. are, are phenomenal. D'Angelo, put me put me with a different group next time because uh, I'm the wrong here. <laughs> I am the Bobby Z of this group. I'm just going to go. Oh, <laughs> just no. Oh. You keep me, dude. You keep our four floor. Oh, oh, yeah, just oh. right on, right on, right in the pocket. In the pocket. <laughs>